second reading is from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, <clears throat> because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? The Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They were filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. The men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show them portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun, the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thank you. I didn't grow up in a household where poetry was read or eloquent prayers were prayed. That just was not my upbringing. However, I did grow up in a household where nighttime stories were shared and where proper grammar mattered a lot. I have distinct memories of my brother and I curled up alongside my father in the like 1980s lazy boy chair, you know, those overstuffed chairs, um, as he read The Hobbit to us, complete with character voices and an exacted cadence to add drama to it. I also remember being gently corrected and encouraged to use may and can properly along with I and me, she and her, he and him, and also the exacting art of whom. Language mattered a lot in my household. And so words matter to me now. It's why I write a full manuscript when I preach, because I place an infinite amount of weight on each word and worry that if I just spoke off the cuff, I might somehow do an injustice to God. Many of my colleagues don't need the security of words in front of them, and I envy that ability to speak smoothly and coherently. I am very aware that this is more related to my insecurity as a public speaker than the actual power that my words can impart. However, I believe that the undergirding of words matter is why, as I've grown older, I found much solace and truth in poetry and lyrics in biblical stories and in memoirs. All of these genres use words to summon worlds into being, which is a long-standing tradition and understanding within rabbinical thought, that our words can spin worlds into being. And so um, these words that are up here, when I read these words this week by Gregory Orr, they took my breath away because they speak deep spirit truths. And they seem to be stirring anew the hope of our forefathers and foremothers. And so basically, if you hear nothing else that I say today, please pause now and hear these words. Let's remake the world with words. Not frivolously, nor to hide from what we fear. But with a purpose. Let's, as Wordsworth said, remove the dust of custom. So things shine again. 
each object arrayed in its robe of original light. And then we'll see the world, as if for the first time, as once we gazed at the beloved who was gazing at us. For me, this is a beautiful poem about chaos and responsibility and how our words help shape the world into order and make something of it. And I think that this thought is undeniably the meaning of Pentecost. Utterly undeniably, this is Pentecost. And yet it is so curious to me that these words are spoken into being by Gregory Orr, the poet, who claims he has no faith. He says that he lost his faith on the day that he accidentally killed his brother at the age of 12. He says that nothing within religiosity provided consolation, and in fact that the words that religion attempted to provide only provided premature consolation by saying, oh, it'll be fine, your brother is in heaven. Now, I don't really know, but I think that since the words that were spoken to him held no consolation, helped to establish no order, and did not reflect his reality, he began writing and speaking words into the world, which did provide consolation, order, and reality. Which is, in essence, what God does with words. God speaks and seizes the world, not roughly or by the scruff, but still fervently and tenderly. At the dawn of creation, God speaks words. At the incarnation of Jesus and at the invocation of the Spirit, it is God's words that summon worlds into being. Today, in our story from Act, Acts, it must have felt like creation all over again, with wind and fire and chaos and words. Something new bursting forth everywhere you looked. With all the drama and the excitement of that day, the thing that really made a difference wasn't the fire or the wind, but it was the words. On that first Pentecost, God inspired humanity's language, granting us sacred, powerful words and insight to help shape the world, which is an awesome, and a dangerous responsibility. Because our words can sanctify or they can scar the world. They can create shimmering light or barren darkness. They can heal a heart or they can shatter a soul. In short, our words, similarly to God's words, speak worlds into being. And it seems to me that lately, and social media anonymity probably has a lot to do with this, there is a lack of sensitivity to words. Of course, you would expect the statement from someone who loves words, but mostly it seems like we just regard words as tools. We forget that words are a gift of the Spirit. Over and over again, the Spirit has come to us and has been expressed through words. Now, I know this may sound dramatic, but I believe that one of the great tragedies of our times is that the primary vessel of the Spirit is broken, and namely that vessel is speech. Our words are broken, and our speech unrecognizable to God. We need a Pentecost experience today to refresh our appreciation and wonder of the mystery of words. Not for the sake of words themselves, but for the sake of the working of the Spirit. Because there is no question that creation needs revived and that the world needs new order. Unfortunately, by our own power, we cannot do this. And we would be wise to admit that we cannot. Because the story of the Tower of Babel is ripe with evidence of what happens when people try to be God or supersede God's power. And so we need the Holy Spirit today more than ever. And I know that we don't often call upon the Holy Spirit. We are tame people, at least in church. We don't rise up and shout from the rooftops, and we don't fall to our knees overcome with emotion. But we need her. We need the flames of passion and the winds of change to take hold of us and set us winging. 
We need to pray to the Holy Spirit to, as Gregory Orr puts it, remove the dust of custom from our lives. To kick off the grind that has infested our world, the staleness that has mucked up the church, and the rust that has corroded our vocabulary. Now, I don't know what was spoken on that first Pentecost day, and I also don't know what words were silenced on that first Pentecost day. But I do know that on that day, the question that must have been stirred in each and every soul was this. Are we not of interest to one another? I think that this must have been the question that the Spirit posed to each heart. Because suddenly, they all saw the other with kindness and with wonder. Suddenly, they were interested. And I think that the Spirit poses the same question to us today. Are we not of interest to one another? And by interest, I don't mean, oh, I wonder where she got her shoes, or doesn't he have a fascinating job? I mean something much deeper than that. I believe that the Spirit is pushing our thoughts deeper to consider whether we are people who are in community with one another. Do we call to one another? Do we heed one another? Do we seek to know one another? And I'm not sure we are those people. Not just us, like the world in general. But I hope that we are being formed into those people for the sake of the world and for the sake of ourselves. As deeply as I know my children, I don't know what's in their heads. But I crave to know them that deeply. You know, because I'm a mom, I want to know where they are at 2 a.m. And because I'm just curious about them. This is how it is with those that we love the most intensely. But I think it's also the way we are called to encounter anyone we don't quite understand or even care to understand, whether it be refugees or LGBTQIA individuals or ex-spouses or the boss that makes our skin crawl or the sibling who let us down again or even the person you just see in the metro. We are called to be interested in others deeply to use our words and our listening to be curious. Now, I know this sounds simple or even silly even, but I believe that our words are a gifting of the Spirit. And I desperately believe that they matter now, because there is so much discord, disconnect, division in the world. I want some of you may have heard me say this before, because I have said it often, because it hit me so profoundly. I had someone once say to me in reference to their sexuality. They said, you don't have to understand. You just have to believe me. Which I think is such a powerful statement. So illuminating. Because I don't have to understand. I'm not God. I just need to heed the other. To believe. To listen. To speak. To love. And so maybe on that day, what they finally understood was that the mightiest word is love. Maybe the word of the Spirit is as simple and as complex as that. Love might be the greatest word we can speak and enact. Not just as a romantic word, because there's a lot more to it. The word is sober. The word is grave. The word is not just about light and happy and pleasurable things. The word love calls us to deep, deep responsibilities and to deep, deep relationships. One of the unintentional nuances of Gregory Orr's poem that I love is the use of the words less, let's. It says, let's remain. It's such a small, unassuming word, and yet it matters greatly. When God, the three in one, creates the world, it's let us. But when the people tried to build a tower to the heavens, it was let us. So God disturbed their speech, and it was, let us. There is so much potential and power in working together as one, in being an us. So let us dust off the custom and apathy. Let us be interested and of interest to the other. Let us use words to provoke curiosity and kindness. Let us remake the world with love. And let us see the world as God does. 
And mostly, let the Spirit speak anew through us. Amen.